Hi, I'm Tim Janisewski, and welcome as we continue to spotlight Matthew. In our last several devotions, we've been looking at a portion of the Sermon on the Mount in which Jesus speaks about his understanding and perspective on the law of God, the law from the Old Testament and the law as it was interpreted by the scribes and the Pharisees and the law as he saw it as relevant and germane and important to the life of his followers. And what we've seen is that Jesus demands a higher righteousness, a greater righteousness than even the really religious folks, those scribes and Pharisees. In fact, we have seen that Jesus even elevates it further still. He says, not only unless your righteousness exceeds that of the really religious folks, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. He then goes on to conclude this section in chapter five, verse 48, by saying that you're to be perfect, to aspire to be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. We're to aim at nothing less than God-like perfection in terms of who we are in our character, in our values, in our morals, and in our ethics. Now, as I have gone through and highlighted the six examples that Jesus gives us of this kind of righteousness, my outcome, I don't know what yours is, is woe be unto me. Who is able, who is worthy, who can keep such a high standard of values and virtues and character? After all, I certainly not, cannot say that, that my anger is always righteous and never delves deep into the place of unrighteous and false anger. I can't say that I've, I've never gone to worship and been right with God, trying to be got right with God in worship while I was not right with another human being and, and I'd refused or failed to go and make it right. I cannot say that I have uh, never been in a situation where my eyes have not wandered where they ought not to wander. I cannot say that I have loved my enemy, that I have turned the other cheek, that with my enemy, if he asks me to go one mile, I'll go the extra mile. I, I cannot say that as far as is possible for me, I have sought to live at peace with all people at all times and all situations. You know, there's some people who read the Sermon on the Mount and say, oh, what a wonderful, encouraging, a uh, warming sermon that is. And I get to this section at the end of chapter five and say, woe is me, I am undone, for I cannot aspire to and live up to that standard of moral and ethical excellence that Jesus tells me should be my aim and my goal. And I hope you feel the same way too. And I think we're supposed to feel that way quite frankly. And I want to give three observations kind of in retrospect concerning chapter 5 verses 17 through 48, the section on the law. And the first is this. I think indeed Jesus is directing and commanding us to do something that he knows that we are unable to accomplish. Now, now some, I think, naively say, oh yes, we can accomplish the things that Jesus commands here in this section. Uh, I have yet to meet the person who has risen to such exalted states of ethical purity and morality. No, no, I think we are morally unable to keep this, but Jesus commands us to do something that I think he knows we cannot do, you know? And some people balk at that. They say, why would Jesus insist that we do something that he knows we are incapable of? It's something like a elementary school basketball coach looking at his four foot five to five foot tall kids and saying, you must dunk the basketball. I command you to dunk the basketball. Of course, it's not gonna happen. Well, it's even less likely that we are going to live up to the excellence, the perfections that Jesus directs in these verses in chapter five. I do think Jesus says you should aspire to nothing less than to something that you are morally unable to accomplish. And that should drive us where? Well, I think it should drive us not to despair, but it should drive us, point number two, back to the start of the Beatitudes. Because when I recognize and when you recognize that we are morally unable to accomplish this, we should fall on our knees with the first beatitude that says, blessed are the poor in spirit. We, we are revealed as spiritually impoverished and spiritually bankrupt whenever we try to keep these commandments. 
that are in this section. And if you don't think that's true, just, just try to do it. Try to do it for a month. You know, there's actually a historical story of Benjamin Franklin, not a Christian, but a deist, and he decided that he was going to do no wrong, but only do right for one month, just to see if it was possible. And he fell flat on his face. In fact, Franklin said the only people who think that they can do no wrong, that they can be perfect and ethical and moral all the time, are the folks who've never really tried to do it. Because if you really try to do it, you're going to, you're going to see that you can't do it. And and that there is lack and poverty in our spirit, that we are needy within our souls. And then that should drive us to mourn our sin. Once again, the second beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, who are contrite, who grieve over this moral inability. And that then should lead to the third beatitude. I'm reviewing for us, but this is where Jesus wants to drive us, I believe. The third beatitude, which tells us Blessed are the humble. We are humbled before God. We lose our proud spirit, our self-sufficiency. We lose our sense that I'm okay and you're okay. We realize that we can't be all that we can be. We never can be. And we're humbled by that, which then by the grace of God leads us to hunger and thirst after righteousness, after that which is right in the sight of God all over again. And God picks us up and puts that hunger in our souls that aspires to be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees, that, that once again gets up by the grace and mercy of God because we have fallen at the foot of the cross and tells us that we want to be nothing less than perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. And, and so, point three, we continue this journey, this journey of faith in which haltingly and stumbling sometimes, we make progress. We become more righteous than we were before. We have a greater passion for holiness than we did five years ago or 10 years ago. We want to be godly. That means to be God-like in our attitudes and our perspectives, the way we go about doing our daily life with, with a sense of urgency and a sense of love for that which is godly that we did not have when we first began this walk of Christian faith. You see, we are to be growing in righteousness. We are to be moving towards that excellent perfection. It's called sanctification in theological terms. Sanctification, the process of becoming sanctified. Sanctus, the Latin word that means to be holy or pure or set apart. Hagios, the Greek word that means the very same thing. And there are actually two parts to the sanctification process. The first one is called vivification. We're to, to hunger and thirst for the things that give us life, the life of Jesus Christ flowing through us in our thoughts and words and our deeds. We hunger and thirst after the, the righteousness that brings life. And the other flip side of that coin is that we put to death the things that would keep us from righteousness. That is called mortification, you know, mortuary and mortified, both have the root word mort, which means dead or die in the Latin. So we mortify our sin, which brings us just back again to the R word, repent. We want to see our sin and stop our sin, to turn from our sin and to travel away from our sin towards the good, vivifying, life-giving things of God. And no, we're not going to arrive at perfect righteousness or godliness or holiness in this life. We're not going to be like our Father in heaven until we see him face to face and we know as we are known. But, but take courage. You can make progress and you are to make progress. I hope that you can sense that, that you're closer now than you were a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago to being like your Savior because that's what his call is for each one of us in our lives as we seek to follow these call and commands that he gives us in this section. So think about that. Yes, indeed, you are called to a greater righteousness that you cannot attain. It drives you to the foot of the cross where Jesus indeed takes the time to lift you up, to encourage you and to set you on the path of righteousness once again, so that indeed, 
you may take steps closer to being like Jesus himself. That's our devotion for today. We will continue on into chapter six of this goat sermon, this greatest of all time sermons in our next devotion. I'm Tim Janisewski, and we'll talk to you next time.